Hi, this is Paul, and I have a friend with me on the a show, if you can call this thing a show, uh, <laughs> Len, Len Vanderzee. And actually, Len Vanderzee show. The Len Vanderzee uh, show. <laughs> We've had the Freddie and Paul show. We can uh, have the, the, the Paul and Len show. Um, so, right. Len, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Uh, I uh, am a retired pastor in the same denomination that, uh, that you're a part of, Paul. Um, been a pastor for over 50 years, uh, retired and then unretired because it took on various positions like editor of our church magazine. And I taught for a semester in Korea, had several churches that I did interim work in. So that's been a joy. But that's pretty well. That's, I think that's uh, not something I'm going to be doing much of anymore. So. Wow. Got time to talk to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's but, let's yeah. let's go back. We'll, we'll get to Jordan Peterson, and we'll get to all this stuff in a little bit. But one of the one of the projects that I actually would like to do at some point is to talk to retired pastors like yourself yeah. to to gain some perspective. Now, you you've had a very you've had a very interesting ministry. You were on Long Island uh, when my grandfather was That's there. Right. Yeah. And and you you pastored a number of different congregations. Mm -hmm. uh, what um, what drove you to? And I'll, I have the book here. Let's see. I said it's out. Oh, here it is. Um, not too long ago, you wrote this book called Christ Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Yep. And it's published by Intervarsity Press. I'll put a link to it on Amazon in the in the comments. Now, after after years of being a pastor in the Christian Reformed Church, what what brought you to write that book? Actually, my interest in that uh, began when I was in seminary already. Uh, we had I was part of a club, a student club led by a faculty member, uh, the esteemed and wonderful uh, Hen uh, Henry Staub. Um and we during the three years of seminary we read through Calvin's Institutes. And every student was assigned to have a section of that that they would then explain and, and comment on to the rest of the, uh, the group. Uh, so my section was assigned to me was the sacraments uh, in the book four of the institutes. And as I read through that, I realized more and more that what Kelvin was talking about uh, in terms of how the sacraments, how we understood the sacraments and how they functioned in the Christian life and in the church was very different than what I was experiencing uh, in the church. Um, so the more I get into it, the more interest I had. And that, that sort of remained all the way through my ministry. And uh, when I uh, came later on into a church that um, actually was filled with academic types and they understood what uh, 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 sabbaticals were about and uh, they encouraged me to do some writing. Uh, so I had an opportunity to, to uh, put in a, a proposal to InterVarsity in doing that. Uh, so it was, a, it was a fulfillment of a long time interest on my part. And uh, the writing of the book and the studying for it was really very gratifying and enjoyable for me. Now, now what difference did you see between what you saw, uh, let's say, assumed and practiced in the churches you were serving and what you found John Calvin saying. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I don't want to use terms that may not be familiar with your, with your, with the audience here, but, uh, uh, in the church, that I, the, the, the general understanding of the sacrament, especially of the Lord's supper in the church that I was uh, in at that time, the Christian reformed church was that, um, what you did in the Lord's Supper was to exercise your, uh, your mind and your imagination in, uh, in faith to understand what Christ did for you. So it was an exercise of personal faith uh, and uh, of remembering. The, the, the emphasis was on remembrance, the idea of do this in remembrance of me, which is, as you know, was uh, uh, carved into almost every communion table in Protestant churches. Strikingly, in Protestant churches, not in other churches like Roman Catholic or Orthodox. Um, and the idea of remembering was very much of a mental exercise, that one remembered what Christ had done for you. So uh, it sort of came out as an as a audiovisual uh, exercise 
to help your faith. Uh, and by faith, we understood, we implied, we assumed faith to be? To be receiving, understanding what Christ had done, receiving his saving gifts uh, through his cross and resurrection, mainly in communion through the cross. It was very cross-centered, yeah. which uh, is not... Um, unusual when you read the Gospels, but if you read the whole New Testament, then you realize that that's too limited uh, of a central focus for, uh, for, the, for the Eucharist. But, um, but faith also being, again, I mean, it's very connected to your description of, and I think you're very right, of what the, of what the sacrament was. Faith itself was this imaginative mental exercise and, and perhaps some of the emotional experience that would go along with this imaginative exercise. Faith is very much something that happens between your ears in exactly. your conscious realm. Right, right. It, uh, and it is, so then in other words, the, the sacrament was really something that you do. It was your exercise of faith. It was your imagination. It was your faith that, was, that counted. Whereas what I saw in Calvin was that, no, this is, what about, this is about what God is doing for you, in you, and through you, through this, this action, this sacrament. Uh, so that it was a gift to the, to the receiver of Christ. So that's part of it. The other part of it was that Calvin emphasized uh, that what was happening there is that you were truly receiving Christ. Uh, not in the sense of, uh, of a physical act that Christ sort of became present at the table in a physical reality. Calvin's idea was that uh, through the Holy Spirit, who was always the agent of Christ's presence in reality, uh, we are lifted up. And, uh, but the heart of it is that we do receive Christ. Uh, uh, we commune with the exalted and glorified Christ, and we receive his life into ourselves. And I think that understanding of communion for Calvin came largely out of John 6, which he quoted often. He, he denied that the Gospel of John in chapter 6 was talking about the Eucharist. He thought, no, uh, it, it, it's really talking about our faith and relationship to Christ. Yet he used those texts, you know, when Christ says, uh, if you eat my body and drink my blood, you have life in you. That is my life in you. Um, uh, so that, that's, what, that's what Calvin, he, he talked about the real and substantial presence of Christ uh, in the Eucharist. So that was very different from what, uh, I think, I think if, I, if somebody would have stood up and said, this is what's happening in communion uh, in the church in which I grew up, people would have thought it heretical. They thought, well, what are you, a Roman Catholic or something? Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I just became more and more aware of that, of that contrast. And then in my own practice, in my own Christian life, when I began to accept this gift that Christ was giving to me as his real presence in my life, the, the experience of the Eucharist became more and more important. Uh, so that uh, I began to realize that more and more that, no, this is not something you do once in a while. This is something that you do every week, every time you worship. Uh, that it is always, as it was for 1,500 years in the church, word and sacrament together were uh, how we connected with Christ uh, in, in worship. Um, so that, that too was, on, you know, at the time I was growing up, I suppose maybe four or five times a year they would have communion. So it was a big deal in a lot of ways. Right. Uh, but the very fact that it was a big deal made me realize that in, in other sense, it wasn't a big deal. Because <laughs> if it is really a big deal, like prayer or preaching of the word, then you do it every week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the interesting things that I did not, imagine when a little over a year ago I started on this uh, talking out loud about Jordan Peterson on YouTube mm -hmm. journey was that this was going to bring into the center for me these very same questions of sacraments. Hmm. 
because I, you know, all of the terms that you just used to describe, okay, so God, Christ, presence, mm -hmm. real, mm -hmm. all of these terms are, for all of us, nested obviously in the culture and philosophies implicit, none of which we chose, you mm -hmm. know, all of which we inherited by virtue of our culture and our time. And then for you and I both growing up in a context like the Christian Reformed Church, which even though I'm a few years younger than you, I too, growing up within our Christian Reformed educational institutions, received initially a, a very Protestant biased take on church history mm -hmm. that yeah. what happened in the Reformation was the, the Roman Catholic Church embraced a position that was something like magic mm -hmm. and it became idolatrous yeah. that the, the host is transformed physically into the body and blood of Jesus. Right. And for this reason, and then therefore you have some of the language and, and some documents of an, of an idolatry that the Roman Catholics were embracing, mm -hmm. and that we stood in contrast to them with that presence. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, when you look back into the Reformation period, Zwingli comes to mind, right. who you know, went further. And then Calvin, it seems, wanted to... Well, what did Calvin want to do? I mean, why? He obviously is pushing back from the, the practice that he saw in the Roman Catholic Church in France at the time. But it doesn't seem like he quite... I, I, heard, I heard one guy who used to be, a, used to be uh, I think, a PCA pastor, moved all the way to Orthodox and was complaining about Calvin's real presence and basically saying, nobody knows what he means by that. Mm -hmm. and, and when I listen to you now describe it, all of these terms that you use light up because I don't know that in our current philosophical framework, we quite know how to handle many of those terms. Mm -hmm. So... Can you clarify it at all? Uh, well, uh, in, in one way, the, you know, I, I, when I try to teach people about the sacraments, one of the terms that I use is handle. <laughs> that uh, you could use handle or you could use window was another one. Uh, but if the handle is one that people, I think, uh, grab onto. Uh, <laughs> that's the idea that what God gives us, what Christ gives us in the sacrament is something for our faith to hang on to. So that it's not, as you described, just between our heads. We've, we are embodied creatures, uh, and God made us that way, and God uh, made us good in that way. So it's not that being embodied is in any sense a bad thing. We will always be embodied. Uh, but, he, but God wants to communicate to embodied creatures, and in doing that, God does not communicate to us purely uh, by ideas or words, but communicates to us through uh, 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 substance, through matter, sacraments. Uh, and that's always been the case. Uh, if you look at the Old Testament, uh, uh, the covenants were always sealed by uh, physical means, circumcision, uh, uh, the Passover meal, uh, uh, the rainbow for all, you know. All of these covenants were sealed with with actual physical things, and now, and and that God, what what what, I think Protestants denied is that well, that was sort of baby talk, <laughs> you know. Yeah, God communicated in that way, but those were those people; they didn't really have any understanding. Uh, but no, no, it's not the case. We are always in need of being, of of our faith to be uh, to be uh, addressed physically in in an embodied way. So once I get the idea, okay, when I, when I grasp that bread and drink that wine, I am receiving grace. It's like I grab onto it, and I'm free to grab onto it. I'm encouraged to grab onto it as a reception of Christ himself, which if, I, if it's just a matter of my feelings or my, you know, what's between my, my, my two ears, that isn't enough because my feelings are wavering all the time. I'm always doubting, you know, what, what I really believe. What it, but I grab onto that. Say yes, 
Christ is in me and with me. I, I and that, that's author, uh, the thing is that that Christ authorized that. That's the wonderful thing about it. Right. Yeah, do this. I think, I think a lot of people listening, I got a, I got a note from, I got a note from a friend who, who's been on the channel who I met through, through this and he, I haven't responded to his second note. He, he basically said that, you know, he, he and his path, like many of the people I talked to, he, he embraced atheism and materialism wholeheartedly. Yeah. He had a science background. And through Jordan Peterson, he's now, Jordan Peterson has really disrupted his world. And he's been reading the Bible. He's been visiting churches. He's been, he's been trying to, the words we use, get his head wrapped around, you know, this mysterious thing about reality. Now, I, I think when he would hear you talk and say, Christ, you know, I grab onto Christ I, I think at one point he would he would be deeply confused because now and this is a, a big part of the confusion we have of course in the New Testament we have Jesus of Nazareth mm -hmm. and then we have the Apostle Paul who keeps talking about us being in Christ yeah. and and we and are Christ the, being in us and Christ being in us right. yeah. and and so this this okay so you're using this word what does it mean and how, I mean, because, because again, as I, you know, as I've been doing my wandering through the videos, mm -hmm. I keep bumping up into the Reformation and asking, what turns did we take? Now, now a lot of the Roman Catholic and Orthodox people that I'm talking to would be like, well, you shouldn't have made that turn. But we do know that, you know, Luther and Calvin and many of the reformers these weren't godless people. They were very sharp. They were also very Probably. pastoral. And they, I, they were identifying, in many cases, real corruption. Mm -hmm. and, and so there were things that had to be addressed in the Roman Catholic Church. And, and I think my, many of them were addressed and have been addressed over the years. Yeah. And I think we can attribute the Reformation to a great deal of reform that did, in fact, sort of in the back way, happen in the Roman Catholic Church. But I think for many people today, the, the, the reason we default to kind of the imaginative, mental, well, obviously it's by virtue of our culture, but it's in the Protestant churches, in some ways, all they've had left, they, they, that's, 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 everything else in a sense has been stripped from them yeah. that they can grab onto. At partly because there was, in the late medieval period, I mean, Wittenberg had one of the greatest collections of relics that, that had been accumulated. And, and here is Luther comes and destroys the relic economy. I mean, talk about, talk about ironies. And, and Luther obviously goes after Tetzel because this, this, this idea that the church somehow manages the merits of the saints and will exchange them for donations for building projects in Rome. Yeah, right. You know, but yet at the same time, what, what then happens in the Protestant church all the way out to Zwingli is that Christ becomes a holy imaginative. Christ becomes wholly imaginative. Right. And, and I think that then connects us to this, this question of, of sacraments that, well, we, we paired seven sacraments down to two, but one of the things that I've been noticing as I'm working through this, just as you did with respect to the Old Testament, well, in, in what way wasn't the rainbow, Noah's rainbow, a sacrament? Right, exactly. So, yeah. so, so if someone were to ask, okay, Len, I, 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 I'm kind of understanding this church history, I'm kind of thinking about this, but but what is this Christ, and what is it for, and and how does it actually, how does it actually relate to myself as I'm an engineer, and I work in science and math, and I imagine ourselves to be, you know, 
on this globe that's spinning through space. And I mean, what is this Christ? And, and, and what is it good for apart from maybe giving me a little bit of, a little bit of emotional relief from the general anxieties of this world? Well, uh, one thing, first of all, to, I want to address is the, that in, the, 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 the split between the divine and the earthly, heavenly and earthly reality that you've often talked about and that, that Peterson deals with is actually a product of the Reformation. That's one of the things that happened there. Uh, Zwingli uh, was, a, was a child of his age. Uh, uh, although he was not directly familiar, I don't think, with the philosophy of the late Middle Ages, you know, the uh, 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 realism as, as opposed to, um, what's the term? Uh, nominalism. Uh, he was, in many ways, a nominalist. And that is where that split came about. Uh, Zwingli clearly says the physical cannot communicate the spiritual. They are separate from each other. Hmm. And as soon as the phys- if we say that the physical can, can, uh, can uh, relate the spiritual, then we have made a, a mistake. It's like, like you mentioned, an idolatry. Uh, so that, that is... We are an heir of a of a big Reformation mistake. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, so, and the other part of it is that my sense is that one of the things that the Reformation also got wrong, or partly wrong at least, is that it's so centered on redemption, on the cross and resurrection of Christ, that it forgot that the foundation of it all is incarnation, and that's what the Orthodox Church, especially, has emphasized. So when you talk about how do, how do people understand this Christ that we're talking about? Well, Christ is, as Peterson so beautifully says, this is what, one of the things that drew me to Peterson. Christ is the ideal human being. That's exactly how Scripture presents him. He is the new human. What, what was lost in Adam is now regained in Christ. So uh, when we talk about Christ receiving Christ, communing with Christ, it's that our true humanity, our ultimate identity is locked up in that. We are becoming like him. Uh, that that uh, orthodox sense of, uh, of um, de- uh, deification, I think they call it. No, theosis, I'm sorry, theosis, which yeah. is a b- much better term. Yeah. <laughs> the idea of theosis, uh, uh, I, I think is exactly right, if it's understood properly, that we are of being drawn into the life of Christ himself and that he is uh, he's doing that drawing through his holy spirit and that that's uh when one calls himself oneself a christian we usually say well it's because i repented of my sins and accepted my salvation in jesus christ no 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 it's much more than that is that as i am becoming what god created me to be in christ and and that's happening now Happening now, right? Uh, happens every day, and it have and it's a, that's exactly what the sacraments are meant to to uh, to uh, help us understand, learn, and grow into. So, so someone says, "Okay, well, I, I can I can kind of understand if the preacher is up there and he's talking to me, yeah. and he's." you know, kind of in the context of the sermon, he's teaching me about Jesus and he's giving me some advice and he's saying, well, I should probably do this more than that and so on and so forth. But this, but this, this meal then, this, it's not even a meal, it's the ceremony that we're doing in the church. How, what's that supposed to do? Because again, what I think Within our tradition, we've we've basically sort of said is well those are those are visual aids exactly. that illustrate the sermon. Yep. How, how would you? How would? How? Why do you think John Calvin would would listen to that and say no? That's not it at all. This is. I would, I would say this is how our worship comes to its culmination. That we talk about Christ. We understand Christ and what he calls us to be and to do. And now we get it. <laughs> we receive <laughs> it. Where it's given to us. Here you are. This is Christ. This is Christ's presence for you. Take it, eat it, drink it, and go out and live that life. 
Now, now, how important is it? Because you're a, you're a little bit older than I am, so you're you're safely yeah. within the baby boom generation. I'm, I'm the I'm the, uh, the 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 vanguard of the baby boom. Generation. <laughs> 45. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> the vanguard of the baby boom generation. Right. Uh, it you know the baby boomers were were rather famous for, in a sense, doing their having their own project of 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 demythification, mm -hmm. where before, in order to celebrate the sacrament, you would have a minister of the word, you would have a church, you would have a council, that'd be in the Christian reform space, in the Roman Catholic space, you'd have a, I mean, you'd had all of this ecclesiastical machinery around it. And in a sense, the baby boomers would say, ah, just me and some friends by the beach, you know, mm -hmm. isn't, isn't that just as much a sacrament as, you know, what's happening in church? Well, what do you think of that? Yeah, uh, I think it's mistaken. Uh, <laughs> again, you know, uh, I, I, I differ from probably most evangelicals uh, in the sense that I've come to see that liturgy is deeply important in, in the church and in the Christian life. The liturgy of the church, well, let me put, we go to worship each week to live into the story of God. That's the, and that's a story that is radically different from the story that we live in or receive or hear all through our, the rest of our lives. The story of the world, the story of, uh, uh, of business, the story of advertising, the story, all, all this, the, the story that's going on around us. No, we go every week to be anchored in God's story. Now, that does not happen very well, it seems to me. When uh, it's a matter of getting together and singing a bunch of happy, clappy songs, and for uh, a, a preacher to stand up and talk about, uh, uh, well, here, here's the five ways to be a better family or to strengthen your marriage, or, uh, or uh, these are the things you have to avoid in the world, that, that sort of thing. Uh, liturgy is a drama. It tells the story over and over and over again. And it does so, I think, best with carefully chosen words. Not just sort of what comes off your brain at the time, but carefully chosen words that, that, that immerse us in that, in that story. Now, I admit I, I'm sort of an idea person, uh, somewhat of an intellectual, so I can easily live into that or maybe so though maybe it fits me better than it fits other people, but that's, that's where I feel at home. And, and uh, uh, yeah, the, the liturgy does a large part of the catechizing of, of Christian people uh, by telling and retelling that story, by we're coming to meet with God, the covenant God, who was a God of Israel, who was a God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we praise him. We come before that God and we realize who, we're, who we really are. We look at ourselves and say, no, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what, what Christ is. We open up the scriptures, which is that story. And going through it over and over again, we live into that story from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We read all these passages. We hear a comment on those passages, just like a, I, I love those uh, passages in um, uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, where they have these covenant gatherings, you know, and the uh, the, uh, the law is read, and then it's explained to the people, uh, and then tells them, in this case, go home and have a big feast. <laughs> 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 sort of leads into communion. You mentioned, by the way, the communion. Well, why do we have this little bit of wine, a little bit of bread? It seems so measly. Uh, well, Don't you want a big piece of Christ? Yeah, big, <laughs> yeah have a meal, you know, uh, uh, which they actually did in the New Testament in the early days. But as I reflect upon that, I think, no, it's we're getting just a little bit. There's a feast that's awaiting us. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
we're, we're still under the cross. We're still living on Saturday before Easter as far as our life in the world is concerned. So no, just a little bit is enough because Jesus said it would be enough. Uh, that, 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 that'll keep you going until the big feast day. You know, I, I wonder, to, to switch to the other Protestant sacrament, I, I wonder if in the CRC, the, oh, how shall we say it, the, the Zwinglian slide wasn't quite as uh, wasn't quite as large with baptism as it was with the Lord's Supper. Mm. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, in our Dutch Reformed heritage, uh, uh, Abraham Kuyper, who had lived in late, late 19th, early 20th century, uh, was sometimes accused of so emphasizing baptism that he came close to calling it a, a baptismal regeneration that is uh but but he very strongly believed that god was acting in that baptism and that in that baptism you were you became a part of the body of christ uh so yeah it's interesting that that aspect of it was not was not so much influence as the as the communion part was yeah. uh, although still i think that Lots of Christian reform, reform people, and as well as other Protestants within uh, baptism. Well, what Zwingli said about baptism was that it is our pledge of faith to Christ. Again, something we do, not something that God does to us right. or for us. I, I think in the I think in the CRC, you know, I've. I'm a synodical deputy, and when we do an Article 8 of someone coming in from the Baptist tradition, the mm -hmm. baptism questions always get asked. And I think in the CRC, the, the correct answer in terms of sacraments being God speaking to us, not we professing our faith to God, right. uh, that, that, is, that is fairly secure right now in the church. That answer has been, that answer has been reinforced by ecclesiastical power. And, um, but the, but even the, you know, right now in, in the church, there's been, there's been a, there's been a significant, there's been a significant walking away from the church of younger generations. Mm -hmm. And one of the most common pastoral care concern by, by older generations within the church does surround baptism. That that they they brought these children before the Lord and they offered them, you know. So so we're we're a little nervous about altar language in our in our context, but you know they they offered them to the Lord right. um, for baptism, presented them to the Lord for baptism, and promises were spoken. And of course, in our denomination, we we make a big deal out of okay. Now it's the job of the church to. To catechize, which I, I think we have slipped at in yep. many ways, to catechize and to bring them up in the faith. And we've had a tradition that, you know, baptism, you know, baptism isn't, you know, again, the, the ghosts of the Reformation continue to play in our, in our conversations about these. Just, there was a, there's a Roman Catholic uh, Rachel, Rich, Rachel Fulton Brown, who's been in the Peterson conversation. She's, uh, she converted to Roman Catholicism. She's an, she's a scholar at university of, of Chicago. Just, just yesterday, she tweeted something just, just, you know, does baptism work? And I thought, oh my, oh, oh, oh. You know, if, if, if this, if just in those three little words, how much of Everything is right there. Okay, what do you mean by work? Yeah, what do right. you mean by baptism? So, so uh, an older person comes to you and says, "Len, you know, back when you and I were young, we were raised in the church. We we had catechism midweek. When we made profession of faith, we, you know, we had to we had to go before the council in fear and trembling, and and we weren't just asked, you know." did I let Jesus into my heart? Exactly. Right. We, yeah. we recited, we memorized and recited the Heidelberg catechism and well, do you believe it? Well, yeah, but, but the emphasis was on, do you have, do you have you, do you have it memorized? Exactly. And, 
And so now this generation comes, and actually, when I do my Sunday school class, when I teach in church, I can very much tell those people who were the products of that generation. They know their catechism. They know all of this stuff. But they, they now look at their, their children, their grandchildren, sometimes their great-grandchildren, many of whom were baptized in the church, and they say, I, I don't know. What happened? Yeah. What happened is, yeah. and, and and so in some ways, your your robust vision of sacraments heightens the anxiety in the conversation mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. now it's not just well, we failed them. Now it's will will God fail them? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, part of my response to that is that sacraments, both sacraments baptism and the Lord's Supper, are, must be responded to in faith. In other words, it's not just that God does not work in such a way that God just does something to us and that's it. God is always looking for a human partner as a, uh, as a response to what, to what God is doing. And so when we talk about baptism, we need to take on the sense of a baptismal identity. That is to 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 uh, baptism uh, identity in this in the same sense really that we that we receive communion. That is, God has given to us the gift of being identified as His children in Christ. I have to receive that. I have to, in fact, identify myself in that way, uh, so that it's not forced upon me. So that, in fact, part of the problem has been the church's loss of a catechetical community uh, that um, which I think uh, is, is in many ways a result of, of uh, in terms of the Christian Reformed Church, uh, a strong encroachment of general evangelicalism upon, upon the church. That is, as you said, uh, I receive Christ as my savior. <laughs> uh, I believe in him. Uh, well, that's not that's not catechesis. Uh, a few years ago, I, I read a book that really changed my understanding about what happens in evangelical churches. Uh, it was a biography of uh, one of my uh, heroes, uh, John Nevin, mid nineteenth century theologian, who wrote a wonderful book called uh, "The Mystical Body of Christ," which is about the Eucharist, and it, he really re- resurrected uh, Calvin's uh, understanding of the Eucharist there. He wrote a previous book called The Anxious Bench, in which he was commenting on the encroachment of Finneyism, which is revivalism, on Reformed and Lutheran churches. Uh, His point was that uh, Finneyism, or the revival mentality, cannot cannot really build a church. That the church is built on two things. It's built on basically word and sacrament or he would put it also catechesis and sacrament. So the, 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 the catechetical life of the church is built around the sacraments, the bap- of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And it, and it strongly teaches what they mean, and of course it teaches the whole, the whole story of God. I, I find it hard to, one cannot really be, uh, I would say fully a Christian, or maybe you say, without having some grasp, some real grasp of the, of the theology behind it, of what this world is as a creation of God, how we relate to God in this creation, uh, what Christ has done for us, how that, you know, uh, there has to be some level of understanding of those things, uh, which goes along with, uh, the, the sacramental understanding of them. There, there's an irony in how some of these things have played out because what we've seen in some cases is, let's say, in the, the Orthodox are fairly new on the scene in the West, but the, the huge swaths of nominalism with Roman Catholicism, highly liturgical, highly sacramentalist church that in many cases did very little catechesis then you've got evangelical churches that have hardly that that have nearly you know hardly any 
do, any any doctrine of sacrament really, but thoroughly, you know, they do a thorough Bible knowledge training in other ways, and and how some of that has played out in in the ongoing march of time in the West with the with with the continued advance of secularism. So it's you know it's it's been very interesting watching these two things play out because yep. you'll find many Roman Catholics with little or no, you know, they've had almost zero catechesis from the church and they've had sacrament and liturgy. Then you've mm -hmm. got evangelicals who really don't have sacrament and liturgy, but they've got a form of catechesis, which has in some ways at least had an impact. Yep. I think the Christian Reformed Church actually for a while did fairly well at both. Yep. Uh, they're a little light on the sacraments, but, but really tried to do both. But I, I, you know, the CRC continues to be part of the ongoing, the ongoing move towards, I think the CRC is being split between evangelical and mainline, probably evangelical with the larger share, but right. Right. that's more of an in-house conversation. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit, let's talk about a little bit about Jordan Peterson, because obviously yeah. Len, Len and I, um, know each other through a, an online forum called CRC Voices that we mm. plunk away on sometimes and where we have our little debates and fights and spats in that group. And so early on after I discovered Jordan Peterson, I would write about him and then, and then you know, of course, Jordan Peterson is not everybody's cup of tea. But Len, you, you grabbed on to him pretty quick. What, what, yeah. what, what caught your attention? The first thing I listened to were the biblical lectures. As I think most most people, that's their their, their starter drug on that. <laughs> <laughs> most Christians, anyway. Um, yeah, I was just fascinated by them. I thought, wow, this guy who isn't even a Christian, a believer, as far as I could tell, uh, is understanding and explaining, let's say, the first three chapters of Genesis, uh, in ways that are very deep and very true. Uh, so that really caught my attention. And uh, I thought, uh, in, in some ways, I thought, I wish that I had had something of what Peterson was talking about in seminary. I would have preached a lot better uh, through the years. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I felt for a long time, uh, believed for a long time that the uh, first chapters of Genesis are fundamentally mythological. That they aren't describing a... Uh, a reality that like with TV camera was there that would have captured that. Uh, but, but the understanding, the, the, the archetypal understanding that he presents, I think was, is very deep and, and very true. And it's, and it's uh, captivating for people, even people who, have, who don't have any acquaintance with the Bible, but some little bit of understanding, they want to go back and read those chapters again, you know, yeah, well, it's this yeah. Cain and Abel story. So it's just brilliant and fascinating material yeah, uh yeah. and and uh, you know so it's it's god's joke i guess <laughs> to, well after all of our evangelism efforts you know uh you know where will you go after you die that some you know professor unbelieving professor up in toronto uh captures the imagination of of thousands of young people in the in, in the bible you know, just, that's that's god's joke <laughs> I I very much agree. I very much agree. I I couldn't. I I and then the response he was getting. Of course, that has that has captivated me, and yeah. it's been it's been a real privilege to have how many people share their stories with me and be willing to post their stories online about how this how this changed their lives. Um, so it's it's been a it's been a wild ride. Uh, now I've been I've been driving most of this conversation, and I don't want to I don't want to hog the wheel. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to go into and talk about, or any questions you might have had. Well, I, um, I'm actually uh, contemplating some some more writing, uh, and it'd be interesting to talk about that maybe. Um, about about. Uh, I don't know, four years ago or so, uh, I did uh, I did a talk at a BioLogos conference. BioLogos is an organization, Christian organization, that that always trying to reconcile science and faith, science and Christianity. Uh, and uh, 
that's something that captured my attention and so I get involved with them and I, anyway I ended up uh, doing some work and giving a talk and at the end of that talk I did a, a, a brief so I, I want to try to tell the story of God in a way that's completely compatible as far as I can tell with the scientific understanding of how the world came into being and so forth evolution and that's uh, the age of the earth and that sort of thing. So actually you, you can, you can see that uh, video on YouTube. Um, so um, in writing that, I thought maybe I, maybe a wider audience in terms of a book, so, uh, a, a book in which I try to, to give a theologically accurate as well as a scientifically accurate view of the story of God. And there, there are issues that come up with, Evolution. And I'm not saying you know uh, 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 neo Darwinism. I think is is starting to stagger. <laughs> uh, it's not it's not doing all that well. But that doesn't take away from the basic idea that uh, uh, the world, the cosmos, came into being over a long, long, long process. Uh, exactly how God was involved in that is not always clear. See, yeah, clear to us. Maybe it never will be clear to us. Uh, but what is clear, I think, is that God is a God of process. Now, I'm not talking about process theology, which is a very different thing, but that God works, God gives integrity to whatever God makes, whatever God creates, uh, so that even the from the Big Bang onwards, God built into it a future, a and then an, an, an unraveling, an unrolling of its reality. Um, and I think God does that. God does that with us too. So that, you know, for just, just the Bible, take for example. Now, why didn't God just come and bang, you know, send us Christ, and save the world, and get it all over with? Why does He bother with us as creatures to say, you know, I want you to. I, you know, here I want, I reveal myself here and I reveal myself there and I reveal myself in this and that. And then I send Christ and then there's a whole nother long, why does, because that's the way God works. God is invested in us. God is invested in what we do and how we think and how we, how we relate to him and how we relate to go to, to his world. Uh, I think that's a very different understanding of God than what typically Christians have. It's much more of this God out there who does things now and then <laughs> uh, rather than a God who is intimately involved in this process. And also that they don't think enough of, of human worth of what God invests in us as human beings and what God, that God really expects us to understand, to explore, to discover. Uh, so that, that, that's that's something that I want to work out more and more. Um, so I got a big stack of books here about, uh, you know, all kinds of writers about uh, from, uh, oh, Polking Horn, you probably heard of yeah, him, you know, yeah, and uh, you know, yeah. a bunch of others. Yeah, Hot yeah. and, and uh, Peters and uh, yeah. people like that. So, yeah, uh, telling the, sto the Christian story. The, the problem with that I have is that I need to find a science partner, and I think I have one who, who can sort of help me with that side of it, because, I, I mean, I practically flunked out of science when I was in college, <laughs> like I did. Um, uh, took very little of it, as, as little as I could, but anyway, I, I, I think that could be, that could be but so I, what I want to do is to, uh, to provide the kind of theological and biblical background to that that can, that can work. That's that'll that's interesting. I, I remember that video. I'll post it. I'll post a link to it in the in the right. comments here. You know, it's it's interesting because obviously I, you know, BioLogos has a pretty deep connection to Calvin College. Tony Dicamo was on the board. Um, Two professors, or a professor is a president right now. Former right. professor, yeah. Former professor is a president. Her her husband has been you know is has been quite active in some of these conversations. He was. Yeah, I think he was a classmate of mine. I think it was even even in oh, my really? back in the year. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. But you know, one of I I just did a quick search. I don't think they've looked at Peterson at all on the BioLogos um, site. Mm -hmm. No, probably not. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, I think part of, you know, I've, I've been, I've been interested. I mean, part of what got me interested in Peterson initially was, was a lot of the issues surrounding these sorts of issues, but, but more from a pastoral, from a pastoral perspective, because when I would read, for example, Genesis one, well, it seems pretty clear to me that Genesis one envisions a, you know, a flat earth yeah. with a dome I mean, that's a representation in Genesis 1. Yep. And when I talk about that with some people, and I'd say, well, you know, that if we want to take the Bible seriously, in fact, quite take Genesis 1 quite literally, that is the representation that is given us. Mm-hmm. And, and then I would often find it would, be, it would be evangelicals who would start to fudge. In fact, I've told the story before that my, my mother-in-law, who was a fundamentalist Baptist in Grand Rapids, which with Dutch ancestry, she had her King James Bible. And um, back when Leo Peters was putting ads in the Grand Rapids press, she and I were having some conversations about this. And I asked her to bring out her King James Bible to point out some of these things. And I noticed that she had corrected it in pencil in a number of places. (laughs) And I said, now, mom, you're, you're not supposed to correct the Bible on these things, but but she obviously had her worldview she was trying to you know, work the King James into. Right, yeah, yeah. But, you know, one of the things that I've, I've, and so realizing that, saying, okay, so here we have this representation in Genesis 1, and here I have this, this church full of people for whom, and I was doing these lectures for friends who are teaching in universities and stuff, they'd want a little Christian perspective. I'd ask students, say, how many of you believe the earth is round? Every hand would go up. Hmm. says how many of you can give me a can give me a a a non can can describe for me a proof of that the world is round well the 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 picture from space Hmm. okay or magellan okay Hmm. but you know and but nobody really had i said well how about this the mast and the greeks and oh they'd never heard of that Uh, but but it's like okay so on one hand we have this bible that has a flat earth and a dome and on the other hand we're all saying but it's round well, this dissonance doesn't bother any of you. <laughs> and so, and you know, okay, of course, Jesus ascends up. And if mm-hmm. you take a look, so he ascends up because, you know, the Lord's temple is up on top and the right. small representation of his temple. I mean, we know this stuff in terms of biblical studies. So then you begin to have the question, well, what in fact are the relationships between these two worlds? And, and it was, it was my belief that pastorally, even though most people wouldn't say it, this dissonance between these two worlds is a very big deal. Oh, yeah. And, and a lot bigger than we think it is. Yeah. A lot bigger than we think it is. And so when Peterson came around, I, I said, oh, he's trying to bring these worlds together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's... And of course, that started me down the rabbit hole. Well, well, part of part of it too was that the church uh, would never uh, find it difficult to accept the mythological aspect of right. those scriptures, right. because to the church, many people in the church, myth means falsehood; it means fiction. Right. Uh, whereas you know, they don't understand the, the the way in which that term has been used over the centuries. Well, that's that, that that's a that's a major part of it. And I think you you if you don't get that sense. If you don't understand what the myth is and how it functions, then you're never really going to get to the bottom of those first chapters of, uh, of Genesis. And it's always going to be a dissonance. Well, I, I, I also wonder about the project, though, of... I, I, so, so Francis Collins, of course, wrote his book, which was... Right. And Francis Collins was part of BioLogos, and that's been his project. I have real questions about that entire project because I wonder about the frame and I, I wonder about, okay, so let's have, let's have Adam and Eve be, or, you know, communities out of which Adam and Eve emerge uh, to be hunter gatherers. Um, I wonder how telling that i i really wonder what telling that story does because part of what i've learned in this year so following jordan peterson is that we talk and we think we we think we know what our words do to other people and we think we know how they're heard and the impact that they have but i I increasingly believe we have very little idea and 
Mm. And I think a lot of that has to do with sacraments. Because it, if, if we imagine, you know, I've been doing a lot more work with Verveke stuff lately where you have this axial age divide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and what I see, what is he basically a sacrament's doing, sacraments in a sense are the, the connection between, you know, the, the disconnected world. Exactly. And, and the entire story of the Bible is, in fact, the healing of that disconnect. That, that and, Christ, and Christ is the ultimate sacrament. That exactly. Is Christ is the ultimate sacrament. And he is, he is the nexus. And in a sense, he is in a sense, a wormhole. And through that yeah. wormhole, heaven comes down to earth. And at some point that hole will collapse. Right. And he will be all in all. Right. And I mean, that's the story. Yeah. So it's, so then we have these scientific stories and it's like, well, how will these two worlds connect? It's it's a really really hard question. So well, I, I'm not trying to discourage yeah. you from your project. It, it is it is a hard question in a way, but it's also a very necessary uh, question to ask in my mind. Uh, you can't just sort of leave it alone and say, "Well, yeah, that's uh, we, we, these these two worlds are separate." Um, you mentioned about the Christ being, or I've talked about Christ being the sacrament. But last week was. Uh, uh, transfiguration, if you follow the lectionary, Transfiguration Sunday, last Sunday of Epiphany. Uh, and I was thinking about that text. And said, that is a sacramental text, if there's any of them in the Bible. Yes. Christ yes. shines with glory on yes. the mountain. Yes. You know? and, and then, I mean, the, the next connection is, what are we seeing when we see Christ? We are seeing ourselves. It's the transfiguration of our humanity that's really there. That bringing, you know, bringing, you talk about bringing heaven and earth together. Uh, when you talk in that way, there's a sense in which you are talking mythologically. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. yes. Okay. So we have to learn that language. Uh, and we have to learn that language when we deal with, in a sense, with the whole Bible, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it's really hard to 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 bridge that gap. But um, what would be a good example of that? Well, just take take for example. Um, But you talked about the Adam and Eve, you know, and the fall into the, were Adam and Eve really a community or were they two individuals or whatever? Now, those questions become less important once you understand the mythological genre that we're talking about, the mythological understanding that we're talking about. Say, well, it doesn't matter whether they were individuals or whether they were uh, came out of a community or exactly how that fall happened or whether there was a snake on the ground or whether there was a... None of that matters because the truth is so brilliantly clear <laughs> of, of, of how, of who we are in the light of that story. That story tells us who we are uh, in relationship to God, in relationship to the world and creation. Uh, it just, it just, it, 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 it's a picture of, of reality, not a picture of reality in the same sense that of uh, my looking out the window here and seeing the trees and the snow, <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but, it's a, but it's a, but it's a picture of ultimate truth. So yeah, I, I guess I'm saying people need to learn that language, that mythological language. And that, that's what Peterson is doing all the time. The other thing I like about Peterson is he talks about evolution metaphysically <laughs> yes. that's a whole new concept to me yes. that the yes. metaphysics of life yes are part of this re evolutionary process i'm not sure how to put that together yet but yeah. it's a stunning idea yeah well and i you know I, I i completely agree with you on the mythological character of yes. you know of of the first chapters of genesis it, it strikes me though too that you know old report 44 that got so badly beaten up after it was released, but but yet the you know I really like the 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 I think it might have been Willis De Boer who came up with it, but the event character that the that the you know there's 
we can't, and again, I don't know that, I don't know that we can, we know how to put this together. Again, I, I want to say that. And it's just, I can't, see, here's the, here's the thing. Within, within my cultural frame of reference, can I actually give up on that event character? Hmm. This stuff, see, here's the problem. I mean, once you start, this stuff is really, really hard to talk about yeah, right. because you, be, you get into questions of representation. Hmm. And, and in fact, you, you get into, you know, lately I've been doing a lot of thinking about well, what, what actually does our what, – what, what actually does the, the sumum bonum, the, the – the, you know, the, the eschaton, the, the consummation. I mean, obviously, when we talk about those, those things, and, and I very much believe that this is, a, this is a real history to come. I, you know, when I, when I profess the Apostles' Creed, you know, you know, I believe that he will, you know, come to judge the living and the dead. And I, I, well, I it, believe that. I might just point out that I was reading, um, uh, poking horn the other day, and interestingly, you know, many of uh, the theologians who deal with these issues talk about, well, uh, uh, God lives in eternity, and so the future, the eschaton, is, a, is an eternal reality. Porkin says, no, 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 no. It's part of time and history. We are always part of time and history. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. Yes. So, yeah. so, so you've got that, and then to say, so we have all these representations of it in Scripture, yeah. and I think those are but that's we we can't we can't grasp that any other way, and if that is true of this future, mm -hmm. it's probably also true of the past. Mm -hmm. And and then you know obviously what what so often where I boil down to in my videos is in fact the the reality of the resurrection. And you know a number of years ago before the Peterson stuff, I very much came to the conclusion that. We do have a problem in Protestantism with respect to we we in a sense isolate the cross from the resurrection, and you simply can't do that. No. But when it comes, you know, and NT Wright will will point this out when it comes to the language of the resurrection and the stories of the resurrection that we have, you, you almost have the sense that the the witnesses, and I think Bucking uh, or what what his name is his book is up there. Um, Welcome. Yeah, Bauckham. He, yes. He's very right that these are these are witnesses, and and the the witness accounts of the resurrection almost sound like people who are in a bit of shock. They're it's, they're numinous. Yes. Yeah. That people have seen something that that they, they're 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 trying to relate it to us. Yeah. But it's very clear, you know. N.T. Wright says these haven't been, you know, these haven't been em embroidered at all. No. You know, even unlike. Um, the the treatment of the crucifixion that the crucifixion is treated the probably one of the easiest one of the what one of the least doubted elements of Jesus' story is that he's killed by the Romans. Yep, yep. Um, but this is this is in some ways told in a very mythological fashion via all this Old Testament typology of the Day of the Lord. It's yeah. very clear in the resurrection packages passages. You get to the Easter passages, and it's almost like they, they, they're just they're they're doing their darndest just to get the basics of the story out, yeah. Yeah. and they're not embroidered at all. And it's and it's like, well, this is what happened. And I, I can't do any better than that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and then of course you know. So, so all of this, you know, for, for me, Peterson has, or really what I've learned through Peterson and all of these dialogues have been really a, a lesson in how much we don't know and how very hard it is to, to actually do what you and I um, have been employed to do for all of these decades between us. <laughs> to relate but that's, to mysteries. But that's, but that's been... That's been the lifeblood of my of my life, you know. That mm. every week having to tell that story again and to get up and relate to those scriptures and and say this is what it means. This is how we not not so much this is what it means, but uh, this is God speaking to us. This is yeah. this is God's story, and 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 we can live into it. Uh, what a what a 
what a responsibility and what a privilege that's been yeah. in, in my life. And it certainly is true in yours too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And it's been a struggle at times, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any, any last things before we, before we close this off? Uh, can't think of anything else in particular, but it's okay. uh, been a joy talking with you again, Paul. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm thinking about doing the, uh, the meetup thing here, uh, uh, possibly. And I don't know if there are any in Grand Rapids. I, I haven't run across any. So uh, you know of any here? I don't know of any there. I was contacted by someone in, in Jenison who's interested in starting one. Oh. And I've had a couple of conversations with non-CRC folks in Grand Rapids. In fact, just today I had one. And so, you know, I'll, um, you know, I, I got to watch my schedule, but I, I'm always tempted to, to tell people. <laughs> you are now the, you are now the pastor to the Petersonian uh, community. <laughs> so uh, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Living Stones will pay you for that. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> you get you get some you get you get some shekels to fly me out there. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll, uh, right. I'll help boost your attendance at right. your first meeting. All right. uh, to what to what degree I can. But I, you know, again, well, you you visited our meetup here in Sacramento. Yeah. That, Fun. Just in terms of, you know, again, I can't say enough. I, I was in Ripon yesterday for classes and. A uh, pastor, or what uh, an office bearer of one of the churches said, I've been watching your videos. And I said, well, I haven't just started a meetup here in Ripon. He's like, well, I don't know. I said, I'll come down and I'll promote it on the channel and we'll yeah. get it going. To me, the there there has been an element of the meetup and most of the people at my meetups are, are not regular church attenders. Many of them identify as atheists. Uh, quite a few are kind of post-Christian. But for me, some of what happens at that meetup is the kind of thing I've always wanted to see happen in the church. The church, yeah, yeah. That's sort of church... like what pe people used to talk about AA that way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They still do. But yeah. but this is this is as a pastor, you know, I long to have meaningful conversations with skeptics and people across the the board who are interested in honest serious conversation about things that matter most. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what more fun thing can you do than that? Yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Len, hang on a second, and, and I, I'm going to end the recording, but um, I, I so, I want to say this on the air, I so appreciate you taking the time to do this, and, you know, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, good. And, uh, Wonderful to talk with you, Paul. Yeah, I appreciate it.